Amen, amen, amen. You know, did you know that the Bible speaks of giving, stewardship, more than it does heaven and hell? Did you know that? It's important. It's important. It's a reflection of our heart. And it's a principle that God brings us to. There's no message, no sermons, nothing to motivate a person. God brings you to that place. And uh, I pray that, that uh, he would do that for each of you. Um, I'm excited tonight to be with you. Um, the Lord has been so faithful. He's been so faithful to me and uh, what he's allowed me to experience, the journey that he is, has taken me on uh, has just been so incredible. Uh, in doing that journey, I've had an opportunity to meet uh, and develop significant relationships. And one of those relationships is uh, Pastor Jeff and First Lady Monica. Uh, thank you for entrusting me with the pulpit and the people here that's uh, connected to you, and I take this very seriously. Um, I'm excited about what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, trusting God in a storm. Um, there are storms of life that is, they're just there. Um, it's oftentimes the challenge doesn't come with anticipated problems. There are certain problems or certain things that happen in our life that we saw coming. And um, you can somewhat brace yourself in preparation for that. But then there are some things that come our way that's unexpected, just totally catches us off guard. The Bible says in James, for us to count it all joy. Somebody say all joy. All joy. When we fall into various or different temptations. And the operative word there is fall. Count it all joy when you fall. It, 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 it's the same word that, that's used when the Bible says that the man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves. It wasn't his idea to get knocked in the head. He was ambushed. They laid in wait for him and they pounced on him unexpectedly. So count it all joy when problems come out of nowhere and just ambush us and takes us uh, captive and hold us. Uh, these are the challenges in life. And our scripture is coming from Mark chapter 4 verse 35 through 41. Father, we love you. We thank you. We ask right now that you allow your word to go forth and uh, do the things that it's intended to do. I pray that I may decrease, that you might increase. Draw us closer to you, God. Let us embrace you through everything that happens in this life, on this journey. We bless you now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Verse 35, on that day uh, when evening came, he said to them, let us go 
over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took along, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he said, and other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves was breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on a cushion, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Verse 39. And he got up and rebuked the wind and, the, and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the winds died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Do you still have no faith? Do you still, do you still, still is the word there that you want to grab because throughout all of this, Jesus had been teaching them to build up their faith. The Bible says faith come by and hearing by the word of God. Unless we hear the word, faith cannot be risen up in our life. Verse 41, <clears throat> they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? I like what it says in the King James Version, that part. What manner of man is this that even the winds obey him? Trust in God in a storm. As I look at faith and define faith, I, I define it in, a, in this way. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. Yeah. <clears throat> Faith is measured by feet, not by feelings. Faith is measured by walk, not just mere talk. Faith is measured by life, not lip service. <clears throat> See, verse 33 kind of <clears throat> brings us up <clears throat> to that <clears throat> when it says, See, Jesus had been teaching all day. He had been teaching the crowd, he preaching sermons, and then he had taken his disciples aside to give them a private word about what he was teaching on. See, he did this often. Oftentimes, he, he talked and he talked in parables, which for some was a mystery. And while the disciples were committed to him, they were just as clueless as the people he was speaking or teaching to. So he called them aside and gave them a deeper understanding of what he was teaching on. And oftentimes, like the parable of the seed, the four different saws, he explained that one to them this seed, this ground means this. The, the thorns and the thistles mean the cares of... He explained it to him, and then he said, the reason parables are come through mysteries because people have ears and they don't hear. They have eyes and they don't see. They have a, a, they have a heart, but they don't understand or perceive the teachings because faith... Without the faith component, we're just hearing mere words. Without the faith aspect of what we're hearing, faith to apply, faith to trust it. Got to understand what's the deeper meaning in what he's saying. And that's what this talks about. See, I want to get one thing straight. 
the disciples were smack dab in the will of God when all of this was taking place. They was in God's will. Well, why do I, how can I say that? He said, get in the boat, and they did what? They got in the boat. Was it, well, why we got to get in the boat? It wasn't no kickback, no pushback. He said, do this. They did it. He said, come. They went. He said, stop. They stopped. They were committed to him, and he knew that. So he invested something different to those that was committed to him because he needed to build them up in their faith for what life was going to bring to them. See, the journey that God has us on life is a journey. Life is a journey. When we made the great exchange... And I pray everyone here has made the great exchange. What exchange am I referring to? The great exchange is trading your sin for his righteousness. Have anybody done that? Come on, talk to me then. Meaning the gospel was presented to you and you've accepted what was done on Calvary's cross, you've accepted that and you've asked him to take your life and make something out of it. I, I, I accept what you've done, that you died for me. Now, here go the exchange. Here's my sin for your righteousness. Now, teach me as you did these disciples. Bring me aside and give me private messages. He would do it. He would do it. He would do it. You need it done. I need it done because uh, as your pastors say, we're knuckleheads. And how many know God loves the knucklehead? Amen. So let's crack this open. <laughs> no pun intended. As they got in the boat and began their journey with Jesus in the boat, the problem described in verse 37 says, there arose a fierce gale of wind and the waves was breaking over the boat so that the boat was already filling up. That word, fierce gale, is the, is the Greek word called lilac. Lilac. It's a lilac. Well, what's a lilac? It's not just some ordinary storm that tend to pass over. It's not something that was predictable because it came out of nowhere. See, Galilee was just, it was like a straight, but in mountains was all on the side. So, so these lilacs would brew up and come around out of nowhere. Count it all joy. When a lilac arise in your life or my life. Well, let, let, me, let me give you a description of a lilac. It's not just something that we can take lightly. This is when a circumstance happened in your life or my life that intimate danger is looming. It's a feeling of hopelessness, helplessness. There's nothing I can do and it seems like this might be it. For the disciples, it, it, this boat is perhaps being tossed and turned, and it's already filling up with water. And, and, and 
Have you ever encountered a situation in your journey that it seemed like all hell them broke loose? Well, God, I thought things was going to get better once I started serving you. I don't see no way out of this one. In, in, at the end of the first service, I was, was praying with this young lady who was facing just a situation that kind of best described this. It, it, it wasn't a, what we're talking about wins, and these are, these are, this happened to them, but as you connected to, the, to your life, it could be a lot of that could be a job, and you the breadwinner. What are we gonna do? For this young lady, it was court that's coming up and could lose custody. You can see it. What am I gonna do when this thing comes out of nowhere? See, for the disciples, the, the boat was filling up, the wind was blowing at such a speed that it threatened to take them under. Has it been situations in your life that look like it is threatened to take you under? <clears throat> There's three things that I want to point out about a storm. A lot lack. Number one, it's a circumstantial storm, meaning the circumstances were out of their control. There was nothing they can do about this lilac. There's nothing they can do about what they were facing. They could not turn it off. They could not duck from under it. They in the middle of it. Even if they decide to go backwards, they still in the middle of it. There are lilacs, there are storms that bruise in our life that we can't do nothing about it because number one is out of our control. We didn't create it. We can't turn it off. We can't control it. There's absolutely nothing we can do about it. One of the gifts of the Spirit that's mentioned in Galatians is self-control. Self-control is also knowing what you and I can't control. That, that's a part about, that's one thing about Having the spirit of self-control is knowing what's out of my control. When you or I try to control something that we have no control over, it's going to produce a different level of, of, of turmoil that's outside of the lilac. I already got this going on out there. Now I got all of this anxiety and all the, oh, glory to God, I'm preaching to myself. I should just get a mirror and preach to myself. I'm talking about that, 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 that believe me, let me just lead to the second point. The second point of this storm that in this one, it was an emotional storm. When, when, when this thing go to twirling in my life and, and, and I don't have that level, are you still without faith? Remember that term. I want you to remember, are you still without faith? that now this thing is out of my control. I'm a control freak. I want to be able to control this. I've been in charge now where I'm at now for almost 20 years, telling people what to do, hiring people, doing this, doing that, a man of control. But when there's something that comes in my life that I have no control over, it's a different situation. Can anybody talk to me?
this lilac, I can't just say to this thing, be quiet. I can't tell my circumstances to line up because it's out of my control. Point two of this, of this storm, about this storm, that it was an emotional storm. How can I say it was an emotional storm? Verse 40, we know that it, they, see, Jesus told them in verse 40, he said, why are you afraid? What they was facing that they had no control over caused a level of fear to arise in them. Now we have to be careful. When we're dealing with situations that's out of our control, and I'm not talking about some migraine headache that you can take some Excedrin and, and it goes away when you wake up. No, we're not talking about this. We're talking about where this thing is filling up. Water is filling up and situations are not getting any better. Seems like they're getting worse. I am troubled on every side. Yeah, I am trouble on every side. The Bible says that the house that was on the sand, the wind and the rain and the flood came to both houses. Whether it was on the sand or on solid foundation. Well, what are you saying, Terry? Lilacs is going to come. If you're in God's will, they're coming. And if you're not in God's will, they're coming. You should have an advantage. Somebody say, I should have. I should. Say it like you mean it. Say it like you mean it. Do you still have no faith? See, fa oh, glory to God. I know I'm going to jump. See, faith is needed in a lilac. See, faith is needed in a lilac. Not fear, but faith. Faith has to be ignited and executed in a lilac. See, if you, if you, see, when you're rattled with fear, when fear come upon you, you would do like the man that had the one talent. What did he do with it? He buried it. Why? He said, I knew you was a hard man, so I buried it. Fear made him bury what he should have invested. See, fear can, can make us, uh, uh, fear can paralyze you where you don't do nothing or fear can make you make a decision that you will later regret. It all depends on the personality of the person. So some people already are high strong. Man, and lilacs just have them like they are on no dose. It's like, whoa. <laughs> if that's you, that's fine. We're going to be praying tonight. I want to read this, 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 this quote from um, Robert Schuller. And, and this is what he said. He said, never cut a tree down in the wintertime. Never make a negative decision in low times. Never make your most important decisions when you're in your worst mood. Wait, be patient. The storm will pass. The spring will come. The third point in a storm, in this particular storm, is called a theological storm. Jesus always taught his disciples the meaning of what he was doing so they can get this down past their brain into their spirit. Life is a journey. And in this journey, God has a way of teaching you and I what he wants us to learn. Through every situation that we face, he has a way of 
teaching us based on how fast we learn, how slow we learn, that there are some things in a theological storm because there are some things as it relates to uh, a principles in the Bible that's more universal, where, where the body of Christ understand uh, 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 the order, the principles, the character, the DNA of God. But as it relates to a storm, because a storm is personal, chances are that if you've committed your life to Christ, if you haven't been in a storm, then you don't really know what I'm talking about. If you're in a storm, you, you do know what I'm talking about. And if you, if you haven't been in one, just wait. <laughs> because there's something that he's going to teach us. There's something he want to correct us. Sometimes storms is not for correction, but sometimes they are. If God chasing us, it's a sign that he loves us because he, he corrects and chasing those that he loves. This theological storm is based on my personal relationship with him. And, and that's where it can get confusing in a universal setting. Because my relationship with, with God and your relationship with God and your relationship with God is based on your experience with him, your knowledge, the environment that you was raised up in. There are some people that was raised up in an environment where God wasn't even present. And there were some people raised up where they said the Apostle Creed for breakfast. So the environment, so my relationship with him is, 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 is developed and it's, it's because of who I am and what I've been through, what I've been exposed to. And, and, and so you don't have to be fearful if that wasn't your situation because the God that I serve can carve out and will carve out a personal relationship with me, with you, with you, with you, it doesn't have to look like mine. It's not going to look like mine. You know why? Your lilac won't be my lilac. Somebody talk to me in here. See, the reason why we have this personal relationship, not based on the relationship my parents had or my grandfather had, that's to get me to the fuller cross. But that's not going to take you to the face of Jesus. It's not going to do it. What's going to do it is that when you carve out, when you have this way of when this lilac comes in your life, do you have a personal way of waking him up? Do you have a way of waking him up? I was sharing in the first service, as I develop and grow and and, and I have a, a way of, 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 of getting a hold of him and having him enter my environment. Uh, just riding. I got a couple of songs in, that I could put in that's programmed. I could put them in and it takes me. Oh, glory to God. I, anybody, these worshipers are smiling. They know what I'm talking about. But there's something that can just take me and set me there. Where, I, where, where something began to transform on the inside of me that changes how I think, how I'm viewing what I am going through. Re hey, when, when the fog is there, I, I can't take chances because I got too many people connected to me. I, 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 I got to be steady in a lot lack. It because of what I'm doing and who I am don't mean I'm exempt from a lilac. I can't have this emotional reaction. I can't come to work all frazzled. An emotional decision is the worst thing you can do in a lilac. See, because once emotions change, what you have made the same decisions 
at some point you don't know. This is a theological song because this is what happened. When they woke Jesus up, Jesus, we got to look at it. He rebuked the rain. He, he rebuked it. They said, verse 38, Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on a cushion and they woke him up and said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He got up. He didn't say nothing to them. Which, hey, listen, that was a stupid question. <laughs> do you agree? Yeah. Duh. It was stupid. Don't you care that we passion? I don't know if Jesus rolled his eyes at him. You bunch of knuckleheads. What are you talking about? Of course I care. I've been packing you around and teaching you all this time. Now you in a problem. Now you just going to bump it on me. Now you in a problem that you can't solve and it's my fault. If you would have been here, our brother would not have died. It's your fault. If you would have did what you did, my mother would have got healed. It's your fault. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus didn't answer them. What did he do? He spoke to the circumstances. He spoke to the thing that was causing them all of the problems. He got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. And the winds died down and it became perfectly calm. Now he turns, once he dealt with the circumstances that rattled them, now he turns his attention to them. This is the theological part. He turns his attention to them once he removed that lilac out of their way because obviously they didn't learn anything from what they was going through. They got the finger pointing. Turns his attention on them and said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Then they became very much afraid. They was afraid of their situation. But once he got up and spoke to the situation, and it was no longer the thing that was causing the fear, they shouldn't have been afraid anymore. But once Jesus asked them the question, are you still with no faith? Now, they become very much afraid. This is the theological part of the storm. The situation has been handled. He talked to them about their faith that's connected to the situation. Whatever you are going through, have faith been exercised? That this is not a church response. See, this is not a universal thing because this is a personal thing because the, the thing that I'm going through, the thing that you're going through is gonna take your faith in him to say regardless of what we going through what I'm going through is not going to trump what he told me well what did he tell the disciples well let's get in the boat get in the boat to go where You don't think I'm able to get you to the other side? You don't think I can get you from point A to point B? Regardless of what 
props up in the way. Whatever he told you, whatever he had birthed in you, don't look at the problems that's trying to stop you from getting there. Put your faith in him and say, God, you put this dream down on the inside of me. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, hallelujah. They became very much afraid. Now they're afraid of him. And then they said, who is this? What manner, that's what it says in King James, what manner of man is this? That the wind, the sea, listens to him. In theology, when I was in school, there was this word that's called hypostatic union. And that's what it is. This is the definition of hypostatic union. A hypostatic union is when the divine and the natural man comes together that can't be separated. They can't be undone. The divine and the humanity part is combined into one. They say, what manner of man is this? What manner of man is this? That one minute he sleep on a cushion and then the next minute he's rebuking the wind and the rain. I can't understand this. I, 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 I'm fearing the wrong thing. What manner of man have you committed your life to? What manner of man have I committed my life to? He is the same one that can go in Gethsemane and drip sweats of blood. He can agonize like a human, not wanting to go to the cross. The human man says, if there's any other way, let this cup pass for me. But the divine says, nevertheless, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, 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 hey. Listen. Listen. I don't want you to fear the wrong things. I don't want you to be intimidated by your circumstances. I don't want you to have whatever you're going through paralyze you to the point that you do nothing. Or anxiety and, and, and these running emotions are caused you to do the wrong thing. There are some situations that come up in your life that you can control. If you're in a bad relationship, just leave. <laughs> yeah, that ain't a lot like, that's just dumb. I don't know, it is, it is not in my notes. That's like Brother Earl said, that's a pop-up. <laughs> but I'm not talking about a situation that you can control, you can do this, you can do that. I'm talking about a situation that looks imminent. This thing looks like it's going to swallow me up. I can't do nothing. What am I going to do? Fear has taken me. I can't go left. I can't go right. I done lost my job. My unemployment is about to go out. I got these three babies and I can't get any help. I can't get anything and I'm doing the best I can and it seemed like my best is not giving up and I'm calling out to God, wake him up in the boat. Wake him up. Don't panic. You can't control this lilac. There's situations in our life that we're faced with that we can't control. You can go talk to people. Talking to people is good. You need to talk. 
You need to have somebody you can relate to. Accountability. They can sympathize with you. But what manner of man who we're dealing with that we connect in our life to Hebrews 4 and 15 says this. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize. The high priest in Jesus can sympathize with us. But not only can he sympathize, he can fix the problem. Not only can he sympathize with what you're going through, he can tell what you're going through to hush. <laughs> yes, he can. He can say, hush, be still. Leave her alone. She's going through enough right now. Back off of him. He's doing the best he can. Lilacs can discourage us. I want to feel hopeless. But the question comes to are you still without faith? There's a level of faith that's required when you're going through a lilac that's different than anything else. There's a level of faith that's required when you're going through something that seems like it's, it's got the best of you. I can't go left, I can't go right. I can't do this, I can't do that. This thing is engulfing me, it's filling up. My emotions are running high. I don't know what to do. This is a level of faith that he wanna bring us to. And as you stand on your feet tonight, I wanna encourage you. I wanna encourage you to get to that place Get to that place get to that place get to that place to where there's nothing you're going through that's going to move you why because what you know will keep you So if you're not in one, I want to tell you that you probably is headed to one. So tonight I want you to take a posture of locking your knees. Tell them, come on here. Go and do what you're going to do, devil, because I know I'm a threat to the kingdom. I know I'm a threat. You had your chance. See, 20 years ago when I walked in the doors of Team Challenge, I didn't know what I can do. But see, listen. Listen. He had his chance. He had his chance. Now, regardless of what I go through, I know my God is able. He's able. Somebody say he's able. He's able. I don't care what you go through. I don't care what you're faced with. He may not take it away. He may do like the Hebrew boys. He may, these Hebrew boys says that our God will deliver us. But even if he don't, you let it be known today that we still not going to compromise. So even if you have to go through your lilac, they was tossed in the furnace it was three tossed and you know what Nebuchadnezzar said I see four walking around and the fourth one looked like the one that can control the lilac yeah yeah hey 
he can control the circumstances to where even if you're in a heated place, you can come out not smelling like smoke. Your clothes are still intact. You can come out of this situation better than it was. Better, somebody say better. Send me through the storm, I'm ready to go through. First, chapter five, I'll tell you why they needed to go to the other side. You read that in your Bible study. 41 was the end of chapter four. Chapter five is a continuation. Who was on the other side? Who was on the other side? It was the man that was demonic, chained. He, they couldn't keep him. He was isolated by himself. And the level of faith that they needed to deal with him, they needed to be built up right there in the storm. I don't know who's waiting on you. I don't know who's on the other side waiting on you. You can't turn back. For where will we go? For God, you have the keys to eternal life. I don't have anywhere else to go. I done forsaken the world. For you tonight, we want to open up the altars as the worship team plays. And my prayer as the ministry team as they come forward, we want to pray for you to that your faith will increase in this tumultuous time that you're going through. And, and listen, if you come up to say that doesn't mean all oh, they we all are going through something. We all are going through something. But in this journey with him, he's gonna take us through what he wants us to experience so he can build us up for what's next. There's something exciting for, for you. God has something designed, carved out for you. Regardless of where you are right now, so we want to open up these altars and pray and touch and agree that this thing gets heavy. We know it gets heavy. And we want to just pray with you. Say, listen, I, I, I didn't know it was going to be this bad or last this long. We can't control it. The people who's praying for you can't control it to say, let it stop. Our prayer is that you come through it and you are the beneficiary of what you went through. Amen. As the worship team play, come on up. If God is leading you, God bless you. Come on, come on.
people. And we thank you for the move of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the word that you put upon Pastor Terry's heart to give to your people. We pray right now that in the middle of the storm that we would have faith to listen to you tell it to hush and stop and allow it to obey the name above all names and that's Jesus. Allow us to walk out in faith as we leave this place tonight Lord as we go home as we go into our workplaces God and in every interaction Lord let us share the good news of your son so Lord be with us and provide us traveling mercies Lord until we come again and in your name we pray amen